let us all bow down for prayer. Our holy and merciful Father who has abundant love and grace, we thank you with our whole heart. Thank you for saving us from our sins. And thank you for coming down to this world and dying on the cross, shedding all your blood. And by that, you you washed away all our sins once for all. And you've given us that amazing, great, and hope to enter your kingdom. And we thank you for your saving grace. You set us apart from this world and you made us abide in the holy congregation and to lead our Christian life together with the brothers and sisters. And we thank you also for being with us all the time. We are very weak and fragile, but you use us as your precious instrument and you um, bestowed on us your grace that we can preach your gospel and we thank you for your guidance. Please watch each one of us <clears throat> and take care of us and rule over us and guide us. And we thank you for your um, guide us, guidance. On this Lord's Day today, all the brothers and sisters who are saved are gathered together in your presence to praise you, to learn your word. And thank you for giving us this precious time. May the Holy Spirit alone be with each one of us so that we may learn how we should conduct ourselves and that we may understand your holy will and how we should, how we should do in our Christian life. Please enlighten us and teach us. So as we are living in this end time, we want to praise you alone and give thanks to you alone. So please help us and be with us. Here in this time, all the brothers and sisters in Gwangju Church are together bowing down before you. Until we stand before you, please strengthen us both in the body and in the spirit so that we can be useful for your gospel. We are praying for those who couldn't join us today, the brothers and sisters, our family members in the, in the Lord. Please remember each, each one of them and give them the same grace. We are also praying for those who are in sickness. Please remember them and heal them speedily so that they can work together with us for your gospel. And we also pray for those who have trials or troubles and in difficulties. By the power of your word, please strengthen them and comfort them and encourage them so that they can draw near to you and they can praise you together with us. All the brothers and sisters who are gathered together in your presence he, um, across the country, please give them the same grace. We also pray for the missionaries and the brothers and sisters who are preaching your gospel in, the, in their difficulties. Please watch closely all of them and protect them both in the spirit and in the body and feel their needs so they won't be insufficient of anything as they are preaching your gospel. Let them have joy and power and comfort only by your gospel. May your spirit alone be with the hearts of all the listeners, and we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's open our Bibles to Genesis chapter 5. Genesis chapter 5. Genesis chapter 5, from verse 21 to 24. Genesis chapter 5, from verse 21 
to 24. Let's all read it together. Enoch lived 65 years and begot Methuselah. After he begot Methuselah, Enoch walked with God 300 years and had sons and daughters. So all the days of Enoch were 365 years. And Enoch walked with God, and he was not, for God took him. Hello, brothers and sisters. I'm so happy to see you. I hope you are well. Oh, you're all well, right? Uh, I'm, I'm not feeling so well today. The lyrics of today's phrase, I thought the lyrics could replace my sermon today. Today we are going to learn a well-known passage. Today's, uh, the title for today's sermon is Enoch who walked with God. And not only about Enoch, but about Noah that was written in Genesis chapter 6, the record about Noah. Uh, we are going to ponder of these two men of great, and there's the uh, Bible accounts that Noah walked with God too. Since we were saved, until we um, stand before the Lord, we have to lead a life to walk with God. And that is a Christian life. In one sense, Enoch and Noah's time, the time Enoch and Noah had lived, might be quite similar to uh, uh, the time that we are living now. So as much as we uh, come closer to the, the end time, I think we have to lead our life to walk with God. That's what I meditated on this scripture. So that is why I picked this text for today's passage. The Bible account uh, about Enoch is written very shortly here. There's nothing uh, special. But we can see uh, the, the expression that he walked with God twice here. Here it says, Enoch walked with God 300 years. It's very short account here in this scripture. <clears throat> So uh, we can learn how he walked with God uh, as we are studying the Bible together. Uh, in fact, uh, Enoch and Noah had something in common. They have had some similarity in their Christian life. Also, Enoch was Noah's great-grandfather. On the other hand, Noah is Enoch's great-grandson. <clears throat> so let's think about uh, the things that is in common between Noah and Enoch. For their entire lives, Enoch and Noah had lived a life to be separated from the world. That was the life to walk with God. That was the life to please God. The Bible tells us. And as they were living in kind of their last days, in their generation, they were making a provision for God's judgment. Though it was a perverse generation, they have kept their faith to the end. Furthermore, they testified of God. They, uh, they sacrificed themselves, they devoted their lives, and they testified of God. That was their lives, Enoch and Noah's life. So they were approved of their faith. And we can uh, just guess uh, what um, the, their generation, just, just a little bit from chapter 4 of Genesis, how they, uh, what was the society like. And we can see that 
It was kind of the last days of their generation. And we are also living in the end time. So the life of Enoch and Noah had something that we can empathize with. So uh, I hope that we can get some lessons and also some warning from their story and from their life. Enoch walked with God for 300 years. And then what is the reason their life gives us um, a great impression? What is the reason their life touches our heart? If their life was without any specific difficulties or sufferings or worries or anxieties, if everything went just fine and their surroundings were just fine and good, and in that, if they kept their faith in that good surroundings, good environment, then they couldn't have been so impressive, but uh, their life at the time was not so easy. They had quite tough conditions. They went through many difficulties and sufferings, and yet they have kept their faith to the end, and they obeyed the word of God, and they pleased God. That is why their life uh, touches our hearts. As we are listening to uh, the testimony of brothers and sisters, sometimes um, we hear many things, and rather than the testimony of, um, about their comfortable life or easy life, but the testimony about uh, keeping their faith in a difficult time, in, in hardships that they could never uh, kept the faith, then they, those testimonies actually gives us a Mm, that moves our hearts, and we are overwhelmed by those stories, and we are encouraged and comforted by their testimonies. If you search the life of the great men in the Bible, uh, we can see that they had many hardships and sufferings, and yet they overcame it, and they pleased God, they kept their faith, and... Uh, when we see their lives, uh, we are overwhelmed and we get a great lesson from them. And we also um, get to make up our mind to imitate their life. So anyhow, uh, we can learn that uh, that was the life of Enoch and Noah. Let's briefly think about Mm, their situation at that time. At that time, uh, Cain's descendants were there together in their generation, and Cain's descendants lived away from God. Let's see chapter 4. Genesis chapter 4, verse 16. Genesis chapter 4, verse 16. Let me read it for you. Then Cain went out from the presence of the Lord and dwelt in the land of Nod on the east of Eden. And Cain knew his wife, and she conceived and bore Enoch. And he built a city and called the name of the city after the name of his son Enoch. To Enoch was born Erat, and Erat begot Mahujael, and Mahujael begot Methushael, and Methushael begot Lamech. Then Lamech took for himself two wives. The name of one was Ada, and the name of the second was Zillah. And Ada bore Jabal. He was the father of those who dwell in tents and have livestock. His brother's name was Jubal. He was the father of all those who played the harp and flute. And as for Zilla, she also bore Tubalcain, an instructor of every craftsman in bronze and iron. And the sister of Tubalcain was Naamah. 
as you know well, Cain killed his own brother, Abel. And he realized his sin. He admitted that he committed a great sin before God. He regretted it. And yet he didn't repent. And, and eventually he left the Lord. And Cain's descendants and their lives are illustrated in chapter 4 here. Cain left God and he built a tower. He built a city. So that uh, indicates um, development of the construction skill. And that um, means a civilization. Jabel became the ancestor of uh, the keeping the livestock. Livestock is means the cattle like dog or chicken or sheep and horse and pigs, the livestock. So <clears throat> it is recorded here specifically that he became um, the father of raising cattle, livestock. So that uh, uh, we can presumably see that a big farm was developed in Jubal. <clears throat> <clears throat> Um, Jubal uh, was the father of those who who, um, who played harp and flute, and that indicates a kind of pop culture or entertainment. Tuba Cain, he was an instructor of every craftsman in bronze and iron. So in Korean Bible, in Korean translation, it says a sharp things made of bronze and iron, and that means he forged a tool of a kind of weaponry made of bronze and iron. So because of the reason they left God, many problems, moral or ethical problems, arose. <clears throat> Lamech bragged about his... Mm, valor and he blasphemed God's name and Lamech denied monogamy he had two wives that was the order of creation God set but Lamech broke God's rule so <clears throat> that was a time of Cain's descendants and during, in that situation, in that uh, surroundings, Enoch walked with God for 300 years. If you see verse 21, uh, uh, chap probably chapter 5, verse 20, 21, uh, chapter 5, verse 21, Enoch lived 65 years and begot Methuselah. After he begot Methuselah, Enoch walked with God 300 years and had sons and daughters. So walked with 300 years. That was awesome. He walked with God 300 years and God took him and he was not. He, uh, and when he was taken up by God, he was uh, his age was 365 years, according to verse 23. So if we do some math, we can see that 82%, more than 82% of his life, he walked with God. Since we were saved, how many percent have you walked with God? Would you please do some math? We just please calculate just a little bit how how much how many percentage have you walked with God if you have never done that and please do it uh, later today how many percent of your life was offered to the Lord how many percent have you walked with God anyhow um, it is written in Genesis account that Enoch and Noah walked with God like I said in the beginning of today's sermon, uh, Genesis gives us a very short account about Enoch's faith life. It's just this expression. Enoch walked with God for 300 years, and that was mentioned just twice. He walked with God, and he walked with God, and he had sons and daughters, and he lived 
180, um, he, he lived 365 years and then God took him and he was not. It's very short. And any specific shape or illustration is not recorded how he had walked with God. If there's anything exceptional, then it is just this um, expression that he walked with God. And in the end, he didn't die, but he was taken up alive by God. So he was not on the earth. He just disappeared. That was uh, something special in his life. Actually, Genesis chapter 5 uh, says someone died. Someone died eight times. It's just um, just um, ordinary life. He had sons and daughters. He had children and then died. He had children and then died. It was repeated eight times. Then so from this short uh, scripture, we can presumably think that the, the life to walk with God can please him. We born-again Christians also need to walk with God. That is uh, the lesson I, um, I could get from this scripture. Then let's think about how he walked with God. Here we can see the word walk with. This word walk with, if you look it up in a dictionary, um, Korean Standard Dictionary, it has the meaning of accompanying or going with, or it has the meaning that they go together to a forced labor. And uh, the original language, it has the meaning that he uh, followed the will of the Lord. So all in all, it means that Enoch uh, led an upright life following the will of God. He was living in a perverse generation. He was, uh, the world was corrupt at that time, but he had a close fellowship with God, and he set himself apart to the Lord from this world. That was we can um, ponder from this scripture. So clearly the Bible says that Enoch walked with God for 300 years, Then was there any reason that he he began he began to walk with God? Let's see verse twenty one. Verse twenty one. Enoch lived sixty five years and begot Methuselah. After he begot Methuselah, Enoch walked with God three hundred years and had sons and daughters. Here it says, after he had after he begot Methuselah. Enoch walked with God 300 years. Enoch gave birth to Methuselah. And I think that uh, somehow became his turning point of his life. After he had Methuselah, he began to walk with God and he did it for 300 years, he had sons and daughters. And the name Methuselah has the meaning uh, of a person who throws a spear at. In the ancient times, when they had a battle, all the soldiers went out from the city, from the, the castle. Then uh, the person who was guarding the gate, who, who is hurling the spear at, the throwing the spear at, he becomes the last person to, to protect the castle. If that person dies, then that represents total defeat from the battle. The meaning of name Methuselah has the meaning of the person, the soldier who throws a spear. So if he dies, if that person, the last soldier dies, then that means total destruction. And the castle, the city will be trampled by um, the enemy country. They will be taken captive and the tribulation will come upon them. And also the name Methuselah has the meaning that um, the destruction, the judgment comes if he dies. Enoch had Methuselah and named him so. 
As you know well, Methuselah was the person who lived the longest. Among all the, the characters in the Bible, he lived the longest. How long had he lived? He lived uh, up to 969. And someone said, Methuselah, when he heard Methuselah, why? Okay, that's pun intended game in Korean word that means why do we need to count his name? Because he lived so long. Anyhow, uh, Methuselah, uh, Enoch named his son Methuselah. Why did he name him Methu uh, Methuselah? Because probably God gave him a prophecy about his judgment. So Enoch knew that clearly God's judgment will come upon the earth when Methuselah dies. So since the time he had Methuselah, he began to walk with God. That's what we, we could figure from this scripture. And Enoch realized that this is the end time. God's judgment is very imminent. Probably God enlightened him to know that. Genesis chapter 5 verse 25 says, Genesis chapter 5 verse 25 says, Methuselah lived 187 years and begot Lamech. So Enoch had Methuselah at the age of 65 and Methuselah had Lamech at the age of 187 and Lamech had Noah at the age of 182. So when Noah was born, Methuselah was about 369 years old. And Noah, uh, when Noah was 600 years on that year, the flood came. So if we, if we do some math, we can see that Methuselah, when Methuselah became 969 years old, the flood came, which is exactly the year Methuselah died. Right after Methuselah died, God struck the land by the flood. That is written in Genesis chapter 6, 7, 8, and 9. Enoch's prophecy was uh, accomplished. Enoch's uh, prophecy uh, came to pass. As soon as Methuselah died, the flood came, the destruction came. And Enoch was taken alive. There's no mention in the Bible that he died. He walked with God and God took him and he was not. God took him alive to his kingdom. So that represents that some day later when the Lord comes again then there will be the people who will be taken alive not only Enoch but also uh, there's another person who was taken alive who didn't see death who was it it was Elijah he was taken up alive on a um, fiery chariot And we could be those who will taste the rapture, who will meet the Lord as we are alive. And those who are ready to meet the Lord anytime, they can lead a life to walk with God. So Enoch walked with God for 300 years. Then let's see uh, what was his life like that he could that he could accompany with God. The meaning of the name Enoch is the person who obeys, the person who follows. And Enoch also has the meaning of dedication. And let's see more specifically how he had lived for 300 years. And that is written in another parts of the Bible. Let's turn to Jude. Jude. Jude chapter 1. Let's 
Jude chapter 1, verse 14. From verse 14. Jude chapter 1 from verse 14 to 16. To 16. <clears throat> Let's all read it together. Now Enoch, the seventh from Adam, prophesied about these men also, saying, Behold, the Lord comes with ten thousands of his saints to execute judgment on all, to convict all who are ungodly among them of all their ungodly deeds which they have committed in an ungodly way, and of all the harsh things which ungodly sinners have spoken against him. These are grumblers, complainers, walking according to their own lusts, and their mouth great swelling words, flattering people to gain advantage. Here we can find the account about Enoch. And we can see more specifically how he walked with God. So what do you think? Will it be easy to walk with somebody or not? Actually, it is quite difficult. Whether it would, would be friends or whoever. Have you ever lived together with a mate? Like, have you ever had roommates or a living mate? Let's say you live together with your friend, no matter how close you were. Living together is not easy. It's never easy. And if, even if it's your um, brother or your sibling, and living together is not easy and i heard that there could be many there are many conflicts and sharing room with your friend is so difficult so not long after they are separated and live separately and we can see that from time to time so uh, we can presume that it's not easy to walk together for so long but enoch walked with God for 300 years. And here we can see Seth's descendants. Enoch was the seventh from Adam. And you can find the name Enoch among the Cain's descendants. Also Lamech, the name Lamech, you can find the name Lamech in Cain's descendants. And also Seth's uh, descendants, Noah's father was a Lamech. So they share the same name, though they are different persons. Their names are the same. But we can see that the measure of their faith or their characters uh, are all different, though they share the same name. So maybe, or obviously we have, we were given the same name that was given by God, the precious name, the name Christian. We share the same name, Christian. And though we have the same name, Christian, some lead a life to please God, some walk with God, and yet others grieve Him. Though we have the same name, and yet our lifestyle or the measure of our faith are all different. The measure of faith and characters are all different. Because we have the name Christian, I think we have to live a life um, worthy of his name. We have to have the the faith and character that shouldn't be ashamed of. And Enoch was the seventh from Adam, and he prophesied about these men. So we can see that Enoch was a prophet, and Enoch uh, prophesied about the coming judgment to the ungodly generation. 
Also, he prophesied about the Lord's coming. We can see that Enoch was such an such a prophet. He so in short, he preached the gospel to the people in this world. That was his life. Here, uh, repeatedly says ungodly, ungodly. It, repeatedly, it it said four times ungodly. Enoch the seventh of, from. At, um, Adam prophesied about these men also, saying, Behold, the Lord's coming, Lord's com Lord comes with ten thousands of his saints. So he prophesied about the Lord's coming to execute judgment on all. So when the Lord comes, the judgment will come upon all the people in this world to convict all who are ungodly among them of all their ungodly deeds which they have committed in an ungodly way and of all the harsh things which ungodly sinners have spoken against him. So here repeatedly say ungodly, ungodly, ungodly. So the the worst thing of ungodliness would be uh, the deny uh, denial of God's existence. He created a universe. He created us, and He has given us the life and breath. He is living, and yet people do not seek after Him. They do not look for Him, and they've never. Uh, though they knew that God lives through his scriptures, and yet they deny it. They are ungodly. Um, ethical sins or moral sins, are uh, they, it, it results from the idea that there is no God. But those who know that there is God will have fear, and naturally they get to serve him. Those who clearly know that God is living, they cannot live on their own. They cannot commit the moral sins or ethical sins uh, on their own, according to their own lusts. Because they think there is no God, they commit all kinds of crimes. And Enoch had lived in such a time he set himself apart from the ungodly men, and he walked with God for 300 years. So was Noah. In the time of Noah, actually, Noah's generation was the worst of worst. It was really the end time of his generation. God gave a clear warning. I will destroy the world by flood. So you make a an, make an ark. So God revealed Noah his plan about judging the world. Noah was not shutting his mouth, but he opened his mouth and delivered the he preached righteousness to people. That is written in 2 Peter chapter 2. 2 Peter chapter 2, verse 5, And did not spare the ancient world, but saved Noah, one of eight people, a preacher of righteousness, bringing in the flood on the world of the ungodly. Enoch and Noah, they were clearly aware of the end time. They clearly knew that the Lord is coming they uh, they knew that God's judgment is approaching, is really imminent. So even today or tomorrow, the Lord may come. They had that mindset all the time. They are always alert. No, Enoch and Noah were always alert to see the day approaching. So those who have that attitude can keep their lives holy and godly. We are also living in the end time. We always say, the Lord is coming, the Lord is coming. But what about our life? Are you living like you are going to meet him soon or later? I mean, in a near future? Because we heard a lot, even um, 10 years from 10 years ago or 20 years ago that Lord is coming, Lord is upcoming. So somehow our heart was loosened about his coming. And God is giving us a warning. He is exhorting us. I'm coming as a thief. A thief. To 
to those who haven't prepared for the Lord's coming, the, he will come as a thief, really as a thief. But if there's uh, any of you who are always ready to meet him, and you, you, if you think you have the attitude that he could come even tonight or tomorrow, it will not be like a thief because you, uh, you are ready and you made a provision. So here we can see more explicitly how he walked with God. He was preparing for meeting the Lord. He was, uh, he, he lived a life to look forward to seeing the Lord's coming. The life to look forward to seeing the Lord's coming. That is the life to walk with God. So no wonder he had to live a godly life because he had to be ready to meet the Lord anytime. And these people always keep themselves clean and pure and godly. Uh, 1 John chapter 3 verse uh, chapter 1 and 2 says, uh, My beloved, my beloved, okay, well, 1 John chapter 3 verse 1 says, Chapter 2, Beloved, now we are children of God, and it has not yet been revealed what we shall be, but we know that when he is revealed, he shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. And everyone who has this hope in him purifies himself, just as he is pure. So those who have this hope of meeting him always purifies ourselves. They purify themselves, just as God is pure. When I see how people are living in this world, I see many problems, ethically or morally. But anyway, they are the unbelievers. They are the unsaved. But even in the church, even among those who, who call themselves a Christian, I sometimes see those who have problems, ethically or morally. So... Um, it's a little bit a shock that there are some among even among the Christians. So uh, my heart is troubled because of that. They are coming to church. They are coming to the fellowship. And yet their life tells something different. Their life is just like the unbelievers. So I feel so sad about them. And there could be some of you who think the Lord's coming will be delayed. So I may have some more time. Actually, that is uh, that thought is quite dangerous. If you have that thought, then probably that will be the time the Lord comes. So we have to be really alert and vigilant. Let's turn to Luke's Gospel, chapter 12. Luke's Gospel, chapter 12. Luke's Gospel, chapter 12. Luke's Gospel, chapter 12, verse 45. 45. Luke's Gospel, chapter 12, verse 45. From verse 45 to 48, from verse 45 to 48, page around 116, let's read it together. But if that servant says in his heart, my master is delaying his coming and begin to beat the male and female servants and to eat and drink and be drunk, the master of that servant will come on a day when he is not looking for him and at an hour when he is not aware and will cut him in two and appoint him his portion with the unbelievers. And that servant who knew his master's will and did not prepare himself to do according to his will shall be beaten with many stripes. But he who did not know yet committed things deserving of stripes shall be beaten with fear. For everyone who, who, uh, to whom much is given, from him much will be required, and to him mu to whom much has been committed, of him they will ask the more. 
So here we can say we can see um, the servant say to himself. My master is delaying his coming and begin to beat the male and female servant to eat and drink and drunk. And the master comes because he has that attitude. He lives, um, is that such a life? You can see the parable of 10 virgins in Matthew's gospel. Five were wise. The other five were fools. The wise virgins. They met the bra uh, the groom but the groom groom's coming was delayed so what happened they all dozed off and slept they fell asleep because they thought the the groom's coming is delayed so even the wise they fell asleep so that can happen even to us that can apply to us as well our lord may come late. And if he thinks so, then there's a high probability that we may doze off. We may just fall asleep. But think about Enoch. After he had Methuselah, he always thought that the Lord is coming. His judgment is imminent. He had that attitude. So how many years? 300 years he walked with God. The life to look forward to seeing the Lord's coming. That is the life to walk with God. And another point, how he walked with God, uh, is manifested in, in the scripture. Hebrews chapter, through Hebrews chapter 11, we can see what kind of life he had lived as he was walking with God. Hebrews chapter 11, Hebrews chapter 11. Verse 5 and 6. Verse 5 and 6. Hebrews chapter 11. Verses 5 and 6. Let's read it together. By faith, Enoch was taken away so that he did not see death and was not found because God had taken him. For before he was taken, he had this testimony that he pleased God. But without faith, it is impossible to please him. For he who comes to God must believe that he is and that he, was, he is a rewarder of those who diligently seek him. Here in this scripture, we can see uh, what is the life to walk uh, to walk with God. That is a life to please Him. The life to walk with God equals to the life to please Him. By faith, Enoch was taken away so that he did not see death and was not found because God had taken him. For before he was taken, before he was taken, he had this testimony that he pleased God. He pleased God. So the life to please God is the life to walk with him. And secondly, uh, we can see um, his life more specifically. In his life, Enoch always was assured that God is living. God is living. God is right before me. He's in God's presence. I'm, I'm in his presence. He was aware of God's presence all the time. It doesn't simply mean that he was sure of God's existence. But in his life, he feared him and revered him and honored him through his life. And that it would be called faith. Without faith, we cannot please him. So what is this faith? That is the life to please God. And that is the life that he was always aware that God is living in his life. 
and that gave a great joy to the Lord. The first condition to get salvation is to know God's existence. God is alive. God lives. The Bible is true. When we believe that, that is the time that we can get salvation. And we realize His love, and we clearly believe, we firmly believe that He is living. All those questions and doubts in our hearts are resolved. But when a man is not sure of God's existence, he asks many questions about, about the Bible. He has many doubts. But when he's really sure of God's the living, God's existence, all those questions are solved quite naturally. When a man is not sure of God's existence, even if they, were, they are given a good explanation, still they have uh, some misunderstanding and they cannot quite understand. So these people should listen to the Bible seminar from the very first session to the last. When they listen to it, or listen through it, the whole sessions, then many of the questions or misunderstandings or doubts will be, or their stereotypes will be solved. The first condition for salvation is to know God's existence for sure. John's Gospel, chapter 17, verse 3 says, This is eternal life that they may know you, the only true God, and Jesus Christ whom you have sent. So firstly, you have to know God the Creator who created the universe, who created you, who has given you the life and breath. You have to know that God the Creator truly lives that is the first condition to get salvation. Not only that, but also after we were saved, our life is sanctified and our life is changed and grow up. And for that purpose, we have to, uh, that happens, that process happens when we are uh, fully convinced God's living, fully convinced of God's living. When we, uh, and that is called awareness of God's presence. Be in God's presence, being in God's presence. That is the Koram Deo in Latin language. And know that uh, God, I'm standing right before God. When you are fully aware that uh, God is living and God, you are standing in God's presence, then your life is changed and you can make a growth in your faith life. So for 300 years, Enoch was always aware that he was standing before God. And that was manifested in his life, how he walked with God. God is always with me. God is right before me. I mean, I'm, I'm standing before him. And that somehow gets us to, uh, to live a godly life because we cannot commit sin in God's presence. So was Noah's life. Noah also was aware of God's presence. I'm standing before God. I'm before God. And that uh, helped him to se be separated from the sinful world. Joseph, you, you are familiar with him. Joseph also could have some, some uh, sinful environment as he was leading his Christian life. There could be, there were some temptations he had many uh, surroundings that gave him um, temptations. It was not good. And yet, even in that situation, he always knew that he was standing before God. That was called Coram Deo in Latin language. I stand before God. Because Enoch had that attitude, he could walk with God for 300 years. In Hebrews chapter 11, we can see Enoch had led a life to seek after God, seeking after God. 
there is a life to seek for God's glory and His reward. Those who come to God should know, must know that He is the rewarder of those who uh, gives, uh, rewarder of to those who are seeking Him. So um, he was looking for, he was seeking for the reward and his glory. Enoch had lived for the glory and the reward. And Moses had, uh, had, Moses' life was quite similar. He lived for the glory and reward that he will receive from God. He had many good points physically. He's, uh, he lived in a quite good environment. He was grown in a good environment, but he preferred to getting suffer, get, get suffering together with the, the people of God. If you see Hebrews chapter 11, verse 24, Verse 24, by faith, Moses, when he became of age, refused to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter. Refused. He refused it. That is a um, quite active motion, an active movement move. He refused to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter, choosing rather to suffer affliction with the people of God than to enjoy the passing pleasures of sins. So he preferred to suffer affliction with the people of God. He esteemed the reproach of Christ greater riches than the treasures in Egypt, for he looked to the reward. So he, uh, there's another man of faith whose name was Jacob, who lived very actively for the reward of God. Until God blessed him, he wrestled with him. It's really hard to wrestle with our flesh when as we are living a life to live for God's glory, actually we find that our body, our flesh is very strong. But Jacob overcame his flesh. He thought that I will pursue the will of God. That was his attitude. So even from birth, he was holding the heel of his older brother Esau. He, it was like, it was a good illustration that I want to go first. I want to be the first son. And through his life, he always pondered how I can get the inheritance of my father. How can I get the, the right of the firstborn? He was seeking for God's glory and reward. Abraham was the, the father of faith. Isaac was called a man of love. Jacob was called a man of hope, man of hope, because he put his hope in the heavenly kingdom. He was waiting for God's promise. He was looking for the reward and glory. That was Jacob. And so was Enoch here. And that pleased God. Apostle Paul also press toward the goal for the prize of God. After he met Jesus Christ, who was raised up, as it is written in Philippians chapter 3, verse 13, Brethren, I do not count myself to have apprehended, but one thing I do, forgetting those things which are behind and reaching forward to those things which are ahead. I press toward the goal for the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. So he had a clear goal, clear goal of life. It was already set right before him. So I pressed toward the goal for the prize of the upward call of God in Jesus Christ. Upward call of God. The prize of the upward call. So the life that is not relevant to the, the prize or reward is... Um, makes Christians lazy because those Christians do not have any goals or purpose of life. They are lost where to go. So they are going astray. From time to time, they are going astray to the world. But Enoch had his goal very clearly, very clear goal toward God.
and he uh, was very sure and he was seeking for God's glory and prize. That was the life to walk with God. Those who are looking for um, the prize have their clear goal. See, the athletes in Olympic Games, they are working for the gold medal. To win the gold medal, they control themselves and they train themselves. Then what about us? Since you are saved, what purpose have you had? And what, what, uh, what kind of life are you leading? That is the part we need to check. And through Noah's life, we can see uh, what is the life to walk with God. Let's turn to Genesis chapter 6. Genesis chapter 6. Genesis chapter 6. Verse 9 and 10. Verse 9 and 10. Genesis chapter 6, verse 9 and 10. Let's read it together. This is the genealogy of Noah. Noah was a just man, perfect in his generations. Noah walked with God. And Noah begot three sons, Shem, Ham, and Japheth. In case of Noah as well, there's the record, Bible record, that he walked with God and he had sons. Enoch also had sons. So we can see that they led their uh, home, uh, they led their uh, family life. They had their life at home. And here it says, Noah walked with God. So how did he walk with him? When God gave him a warning that he would destroy the world by fire, uh, by flood, he commanded him to make an ark. And Noah did according to, exactly according to what he said. So the life of obe obedience. And, and not just follow the instructions, but he did exactly as he, command, he was commanded. Chapter 6, verse 22, verse 22, Thus Noah did, according to all that God commanded him, so he did. Not partly, but all. Chapter 7, verse 5, let's read together. Chapter, chapter 7, verse 5, And Noah did according to all that the Lord commanded him. According to all that the Lord commanded him, Noah did. He did it all. That gives us a great illustration how he obeyed God and how he walked with him. The life of obedience. John's Gospel, chapter 2. When Jesus... Uh, Genesis, uh, John's Gospel chapter 2 illustrates how Jesus turned water into wine and he ordered the servant to fill the, the jar with water and he turned it into wine. And there was Mary, Jesus' mother, and she said, do whatever he says, do whatever Jesus says. And the servant did according to the Lord Jesus commanded. That is the life of obedience. And that gives us a great lesson. Hebrews chapter 11 verse 7 uh, teaches us what kind of faith Noah had. By faith Noah being divinely warned of things not at sin. So he had never seen the rain because there was no rain at the time. He had never seen rain, but he uh, was divinely warned of things not as sin, moved by godly fear, prepared an ark. He was moved by godly fear. He feared God. So 
So Noah as well was always aware of God's presence in his life. In verse 7 continues, uh, he prepared an ark for the saving of his household by which he condemned the world and became heir of the righteousness which is according to faith. So he was divinely warned of the things not as sin. And all of us were divinely warned of the things not as sin. That we have this warning that this world will be judged by fire. That was God's warning. God warned us of his judgment. And we haven't seen it yet. And yet we are moved by godly fear as well. So we live according to his word, and we have to live according to his word. So Noah and Enoch was approved to God about their faith, and they got the testimony that he pleased God. In Noah's, uh, Noah's case as well, Ezekiel chapter 14, verse 14 and Ezekiel chapter 14, verse 20 says, uh, Noah, Daniel, and Job, these three names are mentioned, and there is a great compliment about their faith. Noah, Daniel, Job, and God called them the righteous. And when it, they were called the righteous, it doesn't mean that they didn't have any sins and perfect as God, but at the se very center of their life, there was God all the time. And they... They tried to live a life to live according to the word of God. And God considered it righteousness. They led a life to accept God's promise as it was. And that was called righteousness. So not only Enoch, but also Noah was approved of his faith before God. We are living in the end time as well. And in, the, in this end time, we also have to be approved to God of our faith. That would be really great if we are approved by God about our faith. That will be the most successful Christian life. 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 15 says, Be diligent to present yourself approved to God, a worker who does not need to be ashamed, Rightly dividing the word of truth. Be diligent to present yourself approved to God. So we have to be diligent to do it because it's hard to carry out. We have to strive to do it. To walk with God. Now, what should we do? There are uh, several points that we need to ponder. Firstly, we have to have the same purpose and same uh, goal, same direction. We have to have the same direction to walk with God. Eventually, we need love. And basically, we need love. Love is the prerequisite of walking with God. When we have love, then we can walk together with Him. Um, more specific shape of love is manifested in God's cru uh, crucifixion. The love on his crucifixion is manifested in the shape of forgiveness or service or sacrifice or devotion and solicitude. When we have such a love, we can have the same goal and we can walk to the same direction. We can walk together. We are already dead in, on the cross together with Jesus Christ. Because of our sins, our Lord Jesus was crucified. And when he died on the cross, we were dead together with him. Those who are on the cross had some, uh, some things they have in common. Unless they die, they cannot come down. That is one thing. And secondly, they cannot turn around. They cannot turn back on the cross. So these people have the same purpose, and these people go to the same direction. We bear the same burden, same yoke. 
we bear the same yoke on the same position, then we can walk together with God. Also, we can walk together with the brothers and sisters. Let's find another scripture, Matthew's Gospel, chapter 11, verse 28. Matthew's Gospel, chapter 11, verse 28. Matthew's Gospel, chapter 12, verse, uh, chapter 11, verse 28. Chapter 11, verse 28 to 30. Let's read it together. Come to me, all you who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me. For I am gentle and lowly in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. Here in the scripture, Jesus said, Take my yoke, um, come to me, all you labor and are heavy laden. So come to Lord Jesus, not anywhere else. I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and lowly in heart. So take the yoke of the Lord Jesus, not your own yoke, but Jesus' yoke, and learn from me. But there could be some of you who is taking the yoke of their own and learn from God. W will that be easy or difficult? It'll be really difficult and hard. Jesus said, take my yoke upon you and learn from me. Then your soul shall find rest. But you want some yoke and you take that yoke of your own and try to learn from God. So that's not a rest, but that brings, that gives you the suffering. They learn from the Lord. And yet the problem is they are taking their own yoke, not the Lord, Lord's, uh, not the yoke of the Lord Jesus. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and lowly in heart, and you'll find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. So take the yoke of the Lord. And we have to carry it on the same position. Yoke is on our um, neck or shoulder, not on our waists, right? Or not on our butt. Not on our legs. We have to carry this yoke on the same position. If we carry it on a different position on our body, then it'll go to the other way. The yoke should be more on our neck, which means, um, uh, which uh, represents obedience. God rebuked Israelites and said, you stiff-necked people, they had to surrender to God, they had to obey Him, and yet they couldn't do that. So their neck was stiffened. When we bear our, uh, the yoke on our neck, that represents our obedience. Amos chapter 3 verse 3 says, can two walk together unless they are agreed? To have the same mind and to have the same will, we have to wear the yoke, the same yoke, on the same position. Then we can walk together. Also, to walk with God, um, we have to bear the suffering. Walking together is not easy, so we have to um, bear the suffering. Suffering is essential. As it is written in First Peter chapter 2, verse 19, he... Uh, Jesus suffered wrongfully. Oh, verse First uh, Peter chapter two verse twenty one. Uh, to um, Christ Jesus also suffered for us, leaving an example that you should follow his steps. So Jesus suffered, and he gave us the example to follow, as it is written in the Bible. If you want to follow me, if you are to follow me, then deny yourself and take up your cross and follow me. Mark's Gospel, chapter 8 also, uh, chapter 32 says, says that. And Luke's Gospel, 
Jesus spoke to the people, the multitude. If you are going to follow me, deny yourself and take up your cross and follow me. So even to the unbelievers, if they were going to follow Christ, they have to take the, they have to deny themselves and take up their cross daily and then they can follow Jesus Christ. And it applies to the disciples as well. We have to obey, we have to deny ourselves and take up our cross. And to walk with God, we have to uh, do it together. Don't go alone, but go together, together with a group, together with the wise, which means together with the born again Christians. So abide in the fellowship. Stay in the fellowship, then you can go together. Sometimes I have this kind of counsel and they come to me and they ask me this question, how can I lead my Christian life better? So, and I give them this advice, stay in the fellowship, abide in the church, then you'll be provided the word of God as you're learning, as you're reading, and you get to pray. And as a result of that prayer, you can bring forth fruits. You can evangelize others. So be together with the saints. Go together. If you go alone, probably you can go faster. But if you go together, then you can go joyfully and you can go farther. So brothers and sisters who are sitting next to you, they are precious. You have to consider them precious. Thanks to the brothers and sisters around you, you are keeping your faith and you are leading your Christian life so far. The more we, the longer we lead our Christian life, the more we get to know it, the more we get to know how precious our brothers and sisters are. Thanks to the brother or the sister who is sitting next to you, you are there. And I, that's what I am thinking all the time. So you have to go together with the brothers and sisters. And also, you have to go to the end. Enoch walked with God for 300 years, and then God took him. So he walked with God until he was taken. So as a human being, as a human, it's not easy to walk with, with God for 30 years, right? And actually, uh, we don't have much time to walk with him because the time is imminent. The day of his coming is really close. And yet there are, there are some people, some um, among brothers and sisters, there are some who take a break, take some time off from the church because of some problem in their life or there's because of some hurt of brothers and sisters they do not come to church anymore and then we pay a visit to their home and they share like this pastor i have this difficulty in my life so i had i'm having a vacation of my christian life so when this vacation is over i will come to church well, do we have a vacation about our Christian life? No, we don't have. When we get to his kingdom, then finally we're going to have the vacation. And vacation is good, but we have our homeworks and assignments during the vacation. So there is also a problem. But in heaven, there is no assignment, no homework at all in heaven. Even if we have vacation, it's always, it'll be always joyful. No burden at all. It, it'll be just good. So don't make an excuse of the difficulties in your life or at home or your work or husband or children or parents. You may have many difficulties because of that. But if your heart is bound by all those problems and you cannot spare any time for the Lord, 
then that is quite sad and that's a waste of time. So that shouldn't happen to us. Second Timothy chapter four, verse seven, we have to keep this scripture in our hearts. As Apostle Paul confessed in Second Timothy chapter four, verse seven, I have fought the good fight, I have finished the race, I have kept the faith. I also uh, want and I also um, make up my mind to keep my faith until I stand before the Lord. But who knows? Who can guarantee? Who can be boast of that? So we need to keep it in our hearts. And I'm keeping this scripture in my heart. I have fought the good fight. I have finished the race. I have kept the faith. I have kept the faith. Brothers and sisters, Don't say only with your lips that the Lord's coming is near. We don't know how many times, how much, how many time, how much time we still have. But we do know that the end time is really close. The day of his coming is approaching. So we have to be ready to meet the Lord. That'll be the life to walk with God. So let's remember that. And let's read a little life to obey just according to what he said. Some among you may think you are walking with God. And yet the truth is they are just doing according to their own means and ways. They are living according to their own thoughts. And they are mistaken that they are walking together with God. As it is written in Luke's Gospel, chapter 2, uh, the parents of Jesus, when he was about 12 years old, Jesus' parents took him to Jerusalem and when they came back home, they left him alone and then they just came without Jesus. And they thought Jesus was just among them. Jesus was accompanying them. And they walked three, uh, they, uh, they went a day's journey and then they found out that Jesus was not around. That could be our Christian life. You think you are leading your Christian life to the full and yet you find it without the Lord Jesus and you just lead your life on your own. And there's another case, the opposite case. Though Jesus is with you, you do not know it. Know it. As it is written in Luke's Gospel, chapter 24, two uh, disciples on the way to Emmaus, they were walking together with Jesus, but they were not aware of that. They didn't know Jesus was coming together, going together. So both were the wrong cases. And for the rest of our lives, we have to repay to the Lord for all his benefits toward us. What shall we render to the Lord for all his benefit toward us? And that is written in Psalms. What shall, what shall we, what, with what shall we repay his grace? I'm always thinking about that especially the senior citizens here, as I was having a fellowship with the Silver Group, brothers and sisters, we talked about it. What shall I render to the Lord? What? Unless he takes me, there must be something we can offer to the Lord. You can find it in your life. So you have to find it and offer it to the Lord. Let us all pray together. Thank you, dear Lord. Today, through your word, we learned about Enoch who walked with you for 300 years and also Noah and his faith life when we got a lesson how we ought to conduct ourselves in these last days. We don't know how many days we still have, but we want to live not for our flesh, but for you and for your gospel and for the church and for the brothers and sisters for the rest of our lives. We are weak and fragile and we are insufficient of many things, but you are pleased to use each one of us. May our hearts long for you alone. May our heart yearn for your gospel. May our life please you alone and glorify you 
So please help us to live so. We pray that none of us be lost or stumble before you. But may all of us get salvation and get an assurance of salvation. We want to offer all our life to you alone. We commit your to your merciful hands for the rest of our time and I pray in Jesus' name. Amen.